Today is May 30th, 1996. Our survivor is Frida Bergman. Her maiden name was Hammerman. I'm Lori Fine. We're in Brooklyn, New York, the United States of America, and our language is English. Today is May 30th, 1996. Our survivor is Frida Bergman. Her maiden name was Hammerman. I'm Lori Fine. We're in Brooklyn, New York, the United States of America, and our language is English. Could you please tell us your name? My name is Frieda Bergman. How do you spell it? F-R-E-D-A-B-E-R-G-M-A-N. What was your name at birth? My name was Frieda Hammerman. Could you spell and that? I, I can spell it the Polish way. F-R-Y-D-A-H-A-M-M-E-R-M-A-N. Were you ever known by any other names? I was known as Fridja Hammerman, and my family calls me, people that know me a long time will call me Fridja. Could which you tell creates me? creates big problems for people that don't speak Polish. <laughs> Could you tell us your date of birth? I was born July 14, 1925. How old are you now? I'm 70, I'm going to be 71 in July. Where were you born? I was born in Borislav, Poland. Could you spell the town? B-O-R-S-L-A-W, Poland, P-O-L-A-N-D. Could you tell us about the town? It was an industrial town in the southern, southeastern part of Poland. The industry was uh, oil, petroleum. We had oil wells and refineries. And of course, all the sorts of, of machinery works that service the industry. What other sorts of businesses were in town? Well, like this was the usual Polish Jewish industry. Uh, uh, the Jews were the merchants, and the, the, the Gentiles were the customers. They have, you know, they have, uh, besides the industry, they also had. To, to maintain the, the workers' lifestyle, they had to feed them and clothe them, so there were groceries and, and pubs and tailors and shoemakers and uh, stores that sent ready-made clothing and ready-made shoes and, uh, and all sorts of artisans. Uh, Barbers, uh, that kind of stuff. Wow. Did the oil uh, refineries or uh, the, the wells have any uh, particular smell? No, they didn't. But they had a very particular feeling because that was it's very fat. So in the in the ground, the layer of the geological layer in which they come from is also very tight clay. So Borislav was. They could never, it was always uh, muddy. And the mud was fat. And if you fell, and when I was a child, I once fell into a puddle, and they had to clean it with, with benzene <laughs> to get it off. Do you remember the Jewish population of the town? The Jewish population? The town had about uh, between 40 and 45,000 inhabitants, and I would say a third of it was Jews. Also, the Jews were in Midtown, and all the others were in the surrounding uh, suburbs. Did your house have an exact address? Yes. Julie Skega, 31. Do you remember what your house looked like? What the house looked like? It was a house that was built by, by my grandfather. It was a substantial house. It had four apartments. It had, it contained my, my grandparents' pub and a large apartment behind it with a big veranda, we call it in a big backyard. Then had another smaller apartment where we lived, which was not supposed to be for the oldest son, but we happened to live there because my father had another house in the same compound, but it was uh, lost during a flood which I don't remember, but so in the meantime, before he rebuilt his house, he moved into that apartment. They had two apartments upstairs which were rented out. 
and the usual, the garas, the, the, the utility buildings. Could you tell us about your family? Maybe you can start with your mother. Uh, my mother's name was Blima Hammerman. What was her maiden name? Her maiden name was August, like the month of August, A-U-G-U-S-T. She came from Baroslav. She was born in Baroslav. It was her father before her, which was considered a sort of uh, coming on the Mayflower, because Baroslav was sort, like, uh, or sort of like America. Everybody came from elsewhere. But just so happened that my family, my mother said the Hammermans, my parents were second cousins to the Hammerman sides. The Hammermans were the local Jews because they had an inn between Boroslav, like two, three miles from Boroslav. So when they discovered oil and everybody else started coming from all over Galicia, they were there already. So this was my mother. My father's name. Yeah. Did your mother work? Yes, she helped in the business. And what special memory do you have of your mother? My mother survived with me. She was 45 years old when she was widowed. She was a very intelligent woman, a very smart woman, an outstanding woman. Uh, she refused to remarry, and she lived with me till almost till she was 90. Could you tell us about your father? My father was also my father was a very handsome man. He was a businessman. He was a Always involved, he had friends by the dozens. He was involved in all sorts of social activities. He was the president of the of the merchants' uh, club. He was the vice president of this and the president of that. He was involved in the in the we call a community bank. He was the president of the board, and he, there was forever people coming. Uh, waiting in the house to talk to him about this or about that, or there's some needed the loans. So he was always involved in, in the community. Oops, and he name? was also a member of the Kehira. The Kehira had the board. He was a member of the board. What was your father's name? My father's name was Moses Hammerman. And what business was he involved with? with his, he uh, was a wholesaler name? of soap, oil, and herring. What special memory do you have of your father? As I said, he was a handsome man. And uh, he was also the oldest son in his family. So he was, uh, in the European family, the oldest son is very important. So he grew up as the oldest son. And he always felt the responsibility for all his siblings. It was, it was a given that he's the head of the family. And he always acted like one. And I, being the oldest daughter of the oldest son, and my father, not had, by the time I was born, none of them were married yet. I was spoiled thoroughly. <laughs> Do you remember your grandparents? My, grand, my two grandmothers. Uh, Joseph, they both were stepmothers to my parents, but to me, they were grandmothers. One was living in the same house with us. Her name? Her name was Rachel Hammerman. And my other grandmother, so she was killed during the war. And my other grandmother was Yenta August, who remarried into the Hammerman family. She came to America in 1931. And she lived to be nearly 100. She was 99 and a half, and she passed away 17 years ago. And we have been very close. She, she lived in Wilmington, so at least once a month. And since we have been neighbors, and our families have been neighbors, my husband and myself. My grandmother remembered my husband's father's bris. <laughs> Do you have any siblings? I not now. I had a brother who did not survive. His name was uh, Henrik, or Henrik, for sure it's his nickname. He was 12 years old when he was put in the transport to Belgium which we didn't know at that time. We only knew that they were shipped out. How would you describe your family? I would say my family was uh, solid middle class. 
not rich, not poor, but we never lacked for anything, as far as I remember. Well established, well established both of the August and Hammerman families. What was a typical day like for you? Uh, well, I went to the war site when I was 14. So before I, that, you know, at that time, say when you were 13 or 14. I went to school every day. And I went to, I went to public school in the morning. Then when I was 12, I started gymnasium, which is a, a private school. And uh, I went to Hebrew school in the afternoon. And then I, that's all. And then we, I had plenty of free time with all that. What did you do with your free time? I read. I always did. And also, I was always hanging around my grandmother and my aunts. And they were always sending me here and there and everywhere. I always needed a child to send some place. And, and I'm still amazed at the way that they gave me money. I put it in my apron pocket, and they sent me to buy meat or whatever. And, and nobody even wanted for one minute not to trust me with money. How did you spend your free time? With friends or with um, relatives? Any special activities that you did? Oh, yes. We went in the winter, and we went skiing, and uh, ice skating, and uh, sledding. And in the summer, we went, uh, we, in the summer we went to the country for the summer. Where would you go? We got to the Carpathian Mountains. We went to a village. We, usually, my mother sent us with the maid. And the maid cooked for us. And we went swimming and uh, walking, walking, walking in the fields. And whatever the local people that we went along. Was this maid Jewish or not Jewish? The village was not Jewish. The maid? No, the maid was, yeah, Sam, we had, my us mother usually had the cook who was Jewish. And she had the maid who used to do the, cl the heavy cleaning. But the, see, the cook slept in, but the heavy cleaning did not. Uh, but, but as long as we were small and we were, we were bigger, she only had one, one maid in the house. So whoever was, uh, she either sent us with the Jewish girl, with whoever she had. What was your uh, family's religious affiliation? Beg your pardon? Your family's religious affiliation. Uh, well, there wasn't such a thing as the only way in Poland you could be either Jewish or Orthodox or you could convert. Uh, but there was nothing in between. So you could be uh, Orthodox and very observant, as my husband's family was, or Orthodox and not so observant, as my family was. But you didn't have much, many choices. Do you remember the shul that your parents went to? Yes. I remember there were two shuls that they went to. One was that my grandfather my Hammerman grandfather built. As I said, Borislav was a new town because before they discovered oil, it was a village. So when one day the, there was enough Jews, they started building shuls. So my grandfather built one. What was the name? His name the, the name of the shul. They called it the Shiloh. And uh, he, like, if you put a certain amount of money, you inherited the, uh, the eternal uh, perpetual seat, so you didn't need to buy any seats for us. So he had his seat, and my ha father inherited it. So when I was little, he used to go there. Uh, but then he switched. He only got, went there on the your site, when he had the site for his father. And otherwise, he dumped in the merchant's club. The Jewish merchant's club had the shul. So there he went. So that's where his friends were, so he went there. What was Shabbos like for you? Shabbos was, the store was, the, the business was closed. We went visiting. My mother had a sister. We went every single, she had friends. So we either went to my aunt, or we went to my mother's friends in the afternoon. And in the morning, they usually ate dinner. What would you eat? Mostly what we eat here. We ate chicken, we ate uh, potato kogel. And, and we have no problem with, with heating because we always have the gentile maid in the house. So 
she, and, and, and the winters are very long. So winters were from uh, October to April. So the house had to be heated just to be warm. So, so heating food was no problem because you made, if they made, made the fire for, for heat, we, the, she heated the food too. How did you get heat? What was the source of the we energy? We used to have, uh, when I was small, there used to be coal. And uh, then we had gas natural gas coming out of the ground, but this required already a whole installation. So we had it lately, and in, in between, there was some, but there was several, there was several, um, is, uh, uh, sawmills in Borislav, and they had the sawdust, and somebody developed a system where you could heat the house with sawdust, which was very economical and very long lasting because if you took a, a special with like a kettle or a big uh, you filled it with sawdust it, it burned very long you don't have to do anything so we use that too what was pesach like pesach we always had first say that we went to my aunt my mother's sister and the second say that we went to we would say that my um, they came to us and the, the usual. Before Pesach, poor people from poor Jewish girls from the villages used to come out and work for the masses. They used to come out for a few months and, and roll the masses. And because they needed the money they needed to, 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 for clothing or, or for, for a dowry, dowry was an essential part of life in Poland. So those girls from the villages used to come for a few months, like uh, two or three months before Pesach. And you saw them everywhere, and they were all in masses. And then they went home with a few flotters. Do you remember Purim? Yes. Yes, I remember Purim. Purim was uh, joyous, you know, made home in Tash. And uh, people, but sometimes they had the Purim spiel. Yeah, they walked, walked around, you know, playing a Yosef spiel, they called it, as I remember it too. So, so I sometimes think that I don't remember everything, because it's a long, I said, no, that I blocked it out, or just natural, <laughs> don't remember. But sometimes I think that I blocked out a lot of my past. Do you remember what languages were spoken in your home? We spoke, like, we spoke Polish to each other and to the maids and to the parents and to my grandparents, to my relatives. But my parents spoke Yiddish to each other and to my grandmother, of course. But with me, everybody spoke Polish. And we sometimes had a Ukrainian maid, so we spoke Ukrainian, too. Did you have newspapers or radio we or telephone? We had newspapers. There was a very good... Jewish Polish newspaper called Chvira. It was uh, published in Lvov. And it was so good that the educated Poles read it. It was a daily paper. Uh, did you have a radio? We, uh, we had, the, the people had radios, but we didn't have one. Telephone? We didn't have no telephones. There were telephones in towns, but my parents didn't feel it necessary to have one because my father so all his friends every day. And his, uh, his friends were also his business uh, acquaintances, so he did all his business personally. Was there any source of information other than that newspaper for your current events news? Yeah, but people had the radios. So were you able but to but the, the source of information was the paper. What were you doing before the war? Uh, we had See, I was before the war at two parts. We were in 1939, we were invaded by the Russians. And as far as we are concerned, the war started then because my parents uh, have been business people, which was not very well uh, liked in, in Soviet Russia. Also, we had another problem. My father was a, uh, was a non commissioned officer in the Polish army, so he had another additional. Uh, committed another crime. And people that were not so 
uh, not so favor favorous. So he, they, we were favorous favorous people to, to be sent to Siberia because we were criminals. So uh, my father said, so my father could not get a job because he was a businessman. But if he didn't have a job, he was had to be sent to Siberia. So how was the problem solved? It, it lasted two years. And some of our friends were sent to Siberia, also all the refugees from the western part of Poland, <coughs> they escaped to the eastern part of Poland where we have been. And one day, and of course there were many men who left behind, they were afraid of the Germans, and they said the Germans are going to, to do anything to women and children. So they left the women and children behind and they escaped. And uh, so then after a few months during the, this was in September, 1939, then uh, during the winter, and it, it took a few months, and by that, the, the Germans didn't bother very much the people in, in Western Poland yet. So those people that uh, were, they were homeless, they left their homes and, and, and relatives back in Poland, so they all, they said that that's so terrible, I'm going back. Uh, so the, the Russians, uh, advertise everybody that they organizing transport. People that want to go back to Poland should register. So they all registered. And the first thing they did, they took them to, they, they rounded them up and they sent them to Siberia. And so, but so they survived the war. <laughs> but their families did. Do you remember uh, any pogroms in the area? Yes, that was the first pogrom where the Germans walked in, not before the war, but even though we were always considered second-class citizens. How did you know that? Like, I went to a Polish gymnasium. It was a private school. It wasn't even, didn't even belong to the government. And, uh, we paid for it. They didn't give us anything. And so, but I had, a, I happened to be very, uh, I write well. So, in Poland, we had to, every week, once a week, we always had to write an essay. And all my essays were always A, ne never, never, ever less than an A. And, and the grade was supposed to be based on your essays. So came to, came to, the, you know, to the, uh, the, the grading, I, was, I got A, B. So I went to the teacher and I asked, how come? I said, all my essays were A. She says, a Jewish girl cannot get an A in Polish. I mean, it was just like this. And we were citizens. Was this the same teacher you had had before this? What? The teacher. Was she the same one that you had had before while you were still getting A's? No, she was the one who was giving me A from the essays. I mean, the, if I didn't make any mistakes, she had to give me an A. The grade was up to her. Were you aware of the... And also, you see, if you try to get the, a Polish, a Jewish boy or girl, try to get into university, first they had so-called numerous clauses, which means there was limited number of Jews were admitted. And then they had, by the time it was time for me to say, not yet, but they had called numerous, numerous nulos, none, zero. And whoever was there from before, let's say somebody's father was a professor or who was very well connected, he was able to get into the university in spite of this, they beat him up. So just, you know, you got to university, they beat you up. What was the it, was, it was just taken for granted. What was the general relationship between the Jews and the non-Jews right before the war? That's what I said, but we just knew that we were second-class citizens. I mean, we knew that they were there to be taxed. And, and the, uh, the Polish government said officially that the Jews would be taxed out of existence. What do you remember about September 1st, 1939? Uh, what? Uh, September 1st, 1939. Uh, yes. What do you remember about it? I mean, my father, because he was, my father was a non-commissioned, he was a staff sergeant. And he, you, not, not Jew could ever become a staff sergeant in the Polish army, but was carried over from the Austrian army. He was a staff sergeant in the Austrian army, so it was carried over to the Polish army. And when they, like two weeks before the war, he was called in. He was, 
uh, why would the, uh, he was at the time he was uh, 39 he was 45 years old so why do they call him because they thought they're going to have a war and they'll have to have somebody to organize the supplies and he was known as a as a wholesale merchant so they figured he'll know how to organize the the warehousing the whatever so they called them it. so my father wasn't home when the war broke out and uh, we were home without him. Of course, everybody was very upset. And the war started. We didn't even know where he was. We knew he was in the Polish army. And the war started, and uh, we were afraid of bombs because, uh, you know, industrial city. And, uh, but it didn't last long. And we were not, we were bombed. I think one bomb fell, no more. And then, a few, in a few weeks, the Polish, the Polish army just collapsed, and the, the Polish soldiers started coming home. And like two weeks later, my father came home too. Um, he took off. His unit was captured and, and uh, taken prison by the Russians, because, uh, but he just took off his uniform and walked away, and he came home. And then, of course, we had the Russians, so we had other troubles. But I mean, at the time, we thought there were troubles. But, but what were real troubles are, we, were, we found out later. As a young person, what were your dreams and plans for the future? I always knew I was doing very well in school. I was always uh, what we call here a nice student. And uh, since everybody knew that I can never get into a Polish university, and there was never a thought that I'm not going to one. My uh, parents planned on sending me to Canada because I had an aunt and an uncle in Canada. So they, they figured they'll send me. And I'm ready for university, they'll send me to Canada. But then we never got that, that far. Could you tell us about life under the Russians? Yes, it was, as I said, my father couldn't, we were afraid of being deported. And then, so how was it solved? My father, there was a resort called Troskavitz, which was maybe three miles from Borislav. And they, uh, it was full of uh, fancy hotels, which were privately owned. So the Russian government took them all over, like they took over all the wells and all the other businesses. They set it up as a one big resort for the party members. And they sent in a man to organize it. And that man saw if he'll take the peasants from the street who were, you know, their credentials were good, but they didn't know how to run a business. So he let it be known that anybody who knows how to run a business can come to Truskavitz and get a job. So my father, it was only it was only maybe three miles from where he was not welcome. He went to Truskavitz and he got a job. He, he, could, he wasn't Truskavitz, he could never come home. We had to go and see him, he was afraid. So, and then over there he was welcome, he had the job. He had, he would, they put him as a manager, to manage, they confiscated all the private bakeries. So they had several bakeries under one management. So they put him up to manage the bakeries. And he did. I mean, we know how to manage one business. You know how to manage another. Uh, but it, so, it, so we were that way. We were safe. And then, oh. Today is May 30th, 1996, and our survivor is Frida Bergman. Continue with the, the, the Russian occupation. So also my uncle who owned the well was also thrown out of his, he happened to have a new house. So they took it, they threw him out of his business and of his house, and they moved in with us, so we were rather crowded. And so the times were not so pleasant anymore. What were your fears at that time? What did you think the future held? Oh, we were afraid of We were afraid of deportation to Russia. All the time, it was like it was a year and three quarters. All the time, we were afraid. How did you get your news at that time? Was it the same source or different? Yeah, they also, they, the Russians put up a big radio 
that um, the middle of the town, uh, that um, you could hear it all over. <laughs> you could listen for the town, <laughs> day and night. Do they have any new laws or rules for you to obey? Uh, well, everything was new. But all the old laws did not apply. Everything was different. But they didn't really have the, enough time to put the squeeze on us because it, was, it didn't last long enough. They only started. Were you able to get kosher meat at that time? No, no. But you, still, I mean, you were still able to get a little bit of it. You were, see, even the Paul started with the kosher meat. They made, they, you could get all the chicken you wanted from, from a sheikh or the whatever. But for the larger animals, they instituted a, a limit. You couldn't shecht all you wanted, because they, cause there was a Polish, a Polish saying, which is the Polish House of Representatives. They passed through a law saying that it was not uh, humane, humanitarian to slaughter. So the, just, just gave the Jews a certain amount of, of uh, and they limited. So there was, still, so like in 19, it was 1938 or 37. So the last few years during, you know, the Polish, rule that was still already limited. I mean, there was still kosher meat, but not as, not, not as free as before. And of course, the, the, the Russians, as in the, so there was some still a shaykhut, who shaykhut, you know, uh, so of course, all the Jewish butcher stores were closed with all the other businesses. And the Russian government did not sell kosher meat. <laughs> uh, so if you wanted kosher meat, there was maybe a shaykhut some place who risked the uh, shakting uh, cow, and by word of mouth you found out uh, where the kosher meat is. So there was still some. Do you remember any of the uh, problems with going to shul on Shabbos or anything related to oh, religion? Oh yeah, everybody had big, big problems. We didn't want to be at work on Shabbos. Like my husband's family, you were in big trouble. They, they put you in jail. So what happened with your family? My family, my, 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 my father wasn't home. I don't know what he did on Shabbos, whatever. Yes, he was, he did whatever he had to do. But some people, like my husband's uh, father, they risked their lives. They put them in jail and they also sent them to Siberia. Was there enough food during the Russian occupation? In general, was there enough oh, food to eat? That we had enough food. We had enough, especially. We had enough food, not only did we have uh, what my father made, I don't know, uh, but we had, uh, we had enough put away, enough soap and whatever, you know, stashed it away so we can always uh, barter. And there was enough food, there was no shortage of food. As a matter of fact, we, we lived on that soap that we stashed away during the German occupation too. Because for a piece of soap, we got something. When did the Soviet occupation end? It was June 22nd, 1942. And then what happened? And then people that were smart enough or afraid enough, then uh, those that were, you know, communists, uh, fellow travelers or whatever, or party members, or they ran to this, they were afraid of the, of the Germans. So they ran to the trains and they, they were trying to get out of there and to, to run deeper into Russia. What did you know about the Germans? Uh, but we, 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 we never even thought of leaving. We said, what do we have to be afraid of? We were not communists. So we stayed. It took only five days. So they, they, there wasn't even really enough time to think about it. So we stayed. So what happened? What do you remember? So first, like, so the Germans came in uh, one day. And the next day, right away, they said that they're, they're, going, they're killing Jews. They beat, they're beating Jews. So we heard that they're beating Jews. So we went and we hid, not in our house, but like we lived, uh, there was like, uh, there was a river at the bottom of, we lived on top of the hill, there was a river. And some of our neighbors had like, um, uh, they, like they had little rooms underneath their houses facing the river. So we knew of one like this, so we went there. It, was, it wasn't easy accessible, because from the street it was closed off. We could only go from our backyard. 
So we went there and we hid. All of us, my, my aunt, and my, because we were left together, my her children and my mother, and, 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 and then. You were hidden in the basement? Or? It, was the, it was our neighbor's basement was sort of, it wasn't like without an access from outside. Maybe they used it for storage or for something. But they built a house on the hill, and, and, and the hill is uneven. So front is level, and at the back there's a little more room. But the, so that was, so we hid there, and it wasn't accessible, only from our backyard. Um, so we went there, and uh, then my mother got restless. The, the, the neighbors knew you were there? No. And, and then uh, we had Deutsch neighbors. We didn't live like we lived in a ghetto. We, so then my mother got restless. She said she's going to take a look what's doing. So she walked out, and she went into the house, and uh, the two men came and ordered her. They came, they wanted to, you know, they were looting. Who were they? Our neighbors, Ukrainian, Poles, whoever. So they, so they met my mother, and, and they told her to, to come along. And she, she, she said she, we were, she, she wrote her memo, and she said it was later on, she would try to bribe them. But that time, we were still not used to it. They told her to go. She went. And they had a regular program going on. On the way there, they beat her. They, uh, and uh, she said she came to the place. Uh, that time, the end of the day, that's the Russian police, before they left, they had some poles, and they had Jews, too, prisoners in the, bay, in the, in the south. So they killed. They tortured them, and they killed them. And they left them there. So when the Germans came in, they opened the cell and they found all these bodies. And they showed them to the, instigated the program. So because, you know, because the Jews were then, even though some of the bodies were Jews. And so they said, you, the Jews killed the, the Poles and the Ukrainians killed the Jews. So the spread wrapped them too, if, you know. So, so they, it was in that place near the end of death. There was a big uh, backyard, and they, they assembled all, all the Jews. They were just killing them there, beating them with um, iron sticks. And so my mother was there, and, and they hit her several times. There was one German filming it. And, he, and my mother said he was the only one who looked human. He would look very relaxed. See, everybody else looked like an animal, you know, those are our, our neighbors. They, and, uh, so they hit my mother several times, and she fell on the, she fell, they thought she was dead. That's how she survived. And then, it, it, it lasted uh, like 24 hours. And, and the, these were local people. But meantime, and the peasants from the outlying villages heard that they beat the Jews and, and loot their houses and, and Borislav. They came the next day, ready for, you know, for action. But it was stopped because the, the Polish uh, priest, the, he, he, he took a cross, and he ran to the German uh, commandant, and he says, are you a Christian? What was going on? And he stopped it, supposedly. Maybe they would have stopped anyway, but. Do you know his name? Yeah, his name was, uh, was Oshikiewicz. And he, was, he helped the Jews, he helped all his neighbors, he gave them false papers. How did he get them? Well, he had, you know, all the uh, priests have a register of births and, and, and deaths and, and birth certificates and what, so he gave them false papers. And he, and so then he was, and they, they sent him to Auschwitz, and he was killed there. Oh, so, the, so they stopped, so, so he, supposed, so he stopped the program, my mother came home. Who was this commandant? Do you know his name? There was, there were several police commands there was there was a german po there was a p police that were supposed to there was many there was one police was just for the jews and one police was you know and um, on horses you know, like cavalry uh, there was one police for the war for the fires there was one police for everything so there was i don't know who was the overall pro commandant there was then covered there no not everywhere the gestapo so I don't know what the commandant's name was. 
I think the first day they got the writer for it, so it's the one who, you know, riding horses. I think his name was Vipert. He was uh, maybe, I don't know whether he was a captain. His name was Vipert. But they caught him after the war. And the other from the Russia, from the Ukrainian police, was Nemes. They also caught him. And uh, from the Gestapo, there was Hildebrand. They caught him too. And they asked us, and they made him a trial in, in Hamburg. And they asked us to go and come and testify. So we were making my son's bar mitzvah, so we didn't go, but my mother did. She went and she testified. So they, they gave him such a term that he was out before you could say boo, because they counted all the time he was in jail. Maybe he had got the, the, a year on top of it, and he was a free man. And, and each of these people had a Jewish translator because they could not communicate with the local population. And, and the local population could not produce a translator. But then they need every, each of them has his Jew, a translator. So the Vipa had Dr. Rises, and what name is said, I don't remember. But anyway, the Dr. Rises was the main dolmet, you know, they called dolmet, a translator for everybody. Do you remember any of the rules or laws that uh, came into effect when the Germans took over? The first of all, we were uh, forbidden to, to walk the main streets or on the side. You have to walk only the back streets. And we were, super, we were all, also forbidden to go after 8 o'clock at night. Then we had to wear our bands. And there's a little by little they put down the squeeze. And this took like a few months. Could you describe the armband? Yeah, the armband, every Jew had to wear on his left hand, he had to wear a, a white strip of material. I don't remember how many, that was prescribed how many inches wide with the, with the mug and Do you remember the color of the mug and Blue. Yeah. Did this armband have any writing or message on it? No, no, no. Some places they had used it, but we did not. We just had the R band. Were you still in school at this time? No, the school, I, I was in school till the Russians, uh, uh, when they left. That's, that's, they, it was June 22nd. That was the end of my schooling for three years. Do you remember any other rules or laws? I the Germans? There were a few law and the, and the and I said, the, the, the armband war. And you couldn't travel. You could not walk out the, like, see me, like to Truskavia, where my father had the job, which was three miles, or to Drohobic, which is, which is like a twin city, which is also walking distance, maybe four miles. You couldn't even walk. Of course, you couldn't travel by, I mean, the, main, the means of communications was uh, railroad. You're not allowed to go on the railroad. Were you able to remain in your house? For a while, yes. And then what happened? And then the, when they said, like, uh, we had to, to move to a ghetto. Like, uh, little by little, you know, the Jews in the night of survey, the first summer, they, they let us go, just with whatever it was. Just happened, it was a very bad year, and even the peasants didn't have any food. So some Jews died of starvation, plain. I mean, some, not everybody had reserves. Then they made the, they took away a few hundred people and they shot them. And then they said, this was uh, like took in November. Away? Who took them away to shoot? The German police. They, what uniforms were they wearing? Do you remember? It was in November 41. Do you remember what uniforms the Germans were wearing? I don't remember. No, I, I, it was the local. It was not Einsatzstroke, but it was local whoever it was, and, uh, and uh, like they, to like say, like, did there somebody who was uh, mentally retarded, or was, so they called him in. So his parents came to ask for him. They took them in, too, that's the way they did. So they got a few hundred people, took them out to the woods and shot them. That was the first thing. How did you get news about this? Oh, you could, you could hear it, you could see it. There's, there's some people were shot on the street. 
And this was like in November, but then we had a very severe winter where a lot of people died. My husband was burying them. And, that is, and, and we had typhoid fever, which, is, which was deliberately introduced by the German uh, the officials. Like, because the first people to get typhoid fever were the, the people from the Judenrat who were in touch with the Germans. After the war, they discovered they had a special lab in Krakow where they are breeding uh, uh, lice infest, I mean, typhus infest, typhoid fever infested lice. So the, those German, you know, the, the Judenrat officials came to negotiate or whatever, and they let those lice on them. So they were the first one to get. How did you that. find this out? Oh, it wasn't. Uh, it was, it was obvious. I mean, even then, nobody knew why. But after the war, I read, they had a special lab where they bred them. So my father had typhoid fever because he was also, you know, connected to the. He was, uh, and my uncle. Uh, so we had and my uncle died that winter because so, so we lived all together because they threw them out. The Russians did the job, and so my uncle died. And, and see, typhoid fever was so rare. No, it wasn't typhoid fever, it was typhus, I'm sorry, it was typhus. Ty that the doctors didn't even hear because typhus is only known during the war or pestilence or whatever. The doctors didn't even know how to treat it or what to do. They didn't recognize it. So my uncle was one of the first ones to get it. And he passed away. He died in the house and he was still buried in the regular way. And then my father got it and my aunt, my husband had it. And so a lot of people died, and, and if there was a typhus, per, people with typhus in the house, they quarantined it. So they couldn't get any food or anything. So, so a lot of people died. And this was the winter and the spring. And in the summer of, um, of in August of 42, they, they brought the eyes that struck them, and, and they were by, by that time was maybe, they, they see the Boroslav Jewish population was bigger than before the war, because all the Jews from the neighboring villages and towns, they were sent in, so there were more than before. So by that, by that time, there were 15,000 Jews in Boroslav. Where did they stay once they came into the town? All these new immigrants, where did they stay? It was a small boy movement with families, you know, we squeezed in as, as, as you know, the, the best we could. Did the government force them on you? Did they force yes, they were, for, they, could not, they were forced out of their, of their, if they were not killed before. Those that were alive had to move to, they were forced to resettle. Uh, so then the, the Einsatzgruppe came and they uh, shipped out 5,000 people. So after the ship got 5,000 people, some died out, there weren't so many Jews left anymore. Then they ordered us into a ghetto. How did they ship them out? In, in, um, in trains, in cattle cars. Did you see this? I didn't. I was hit. But my brother and uh, my husband's brother and his father and, and both his brothers, they were both at the, both of them were at the station. They saw the, sh the, 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 the loader. Did anybody have an idea where these people were no, sent? No, no. As a matter of fact, after they were shipped out, all sorts of, uh, there were gunk, all sorts of rumors. There were also uh, people that said, I saw one here, I saw one there, uh, he needs food, give you know. So used to come to the families and they lost somebody. It was the, you know, the Poles or the Ukrainians said that they, they they were there, they saw, I saw your brother, and he needs food, and he needs this. Give me some money, or give me some money, I'll bring you back. I'll bring him back, and so on. So even, even so there was just plain, it wasn't blackmail, it was just the uh, fraud. But we had now, we knew that, I mean, they said, what do they do with 5,000 people, women and children? and. And I wonder, the, the way they loaded them, I didn't see it, but you could see that they didn't mean any good. But we had no idea what happened. We didn't know, we didn't hear about Auschwitz until after we were liberated. And certainly we never heard about Belgians. Was anybody from those transports ever heard from again? Some people were able to jump out and, and come back. But men, so, but so they, were, they were taken care of later. 
Some yeah. people are able to jump from running trains and survive. So what happened next, do you know? So then they, they moved us into a ghetto. So we had to move out. They, uh, because our house was not, was not within the ghetto area. They made two ghetto areas and two different ends of the town, you know, the, the poorest sections. So my mother never knew how to move because she never moved in her life. She moved from her father's house to her husband's house. That's all she ever did. She didn't know how to pack and what to take and what not to take. She was completely, she was a very capable woman, but she's completely disoriented. So we moved into that ghetto. We probably we lost half of our belongings before we got there. there was a, they gave us one room. What determined which ghetto people went to? I think, let's say, uh, if, let's say we knew somebody who, who lived in that area. So they offered to take us in. So they offered us a room because if they didn't take us in, they would take somebody else and maybe who was not so uh, compatible. So they rather had us. Were there any fences or walls around the ghetto? No, no. no. What did it, it look like? It was just open ghetto in the time. What did it look like? It was it like a very crowded quarters of the poorest section of the city. How big was this? It was, um, I don't really know. I don't know how big it was because we lived on the edge of it. So what were your quarters like? It was, we had one room. Our, the people that my, we knew offered us one room. So how many people were in that one room? So we were, we were six people. Was there any plumbing? No. Electricity? Electricity, yes. Plumbing. But, uh, and we had, you know, in another room had another family. Another room had, and we all had one kitchen. Uh, so. And we were, it was really very crowded. What was the and we had, we had good quarters because, you know, we had to be moved in with people that lived there. But other people were very poor, uh, some very poor quarters because they told the poor guy to move out. And they left those hovels and, and the Jews moved in. What did you take to the ghetto? When you left your home, what did you take with you? See, as I said, we didn't know what to take. We took, we took, I was some bedding we took. We took some pots and pans, and uh, we didn't take, we took some furniture, not much, because we couldn't. So, uh, we left it. We just left. We walked out and we left it. What about clothing? Clothing we took. Whatever we, yeah, we took. And food? Food we took too, whatever we had. The CV, the, there was no such thing as, as uh, canned food. Everything was always fresh. We never used canned food, so we, 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 still, we still had some, uh, and then we, we bartered for food. Like we, we took a, a tablecloth and we got uh, two pounds of potatoes. Who would you uh, trade with? The local population. So you had contact with the non Jews? Yes, we did, yes. So, of course, they charged us, you know, they took advantage of it, but they supplied us with food. Were any of them good to you or kind? Uh, even though, like, so, oh, see, when we moved out, we had the Gentile tenants, we had Ukrainian tenants, so always, we were always on very good terms with them. And, this, and, and that time, when we were hiding during the first program, they knew where we were, and they brought us food. Do you remember their names? Yeah, the name was Ivashuk. And but, see, like, she was uh, she was Polish, she was Ukrainian. And then, so when we were moving out to the ghetto, and before, we knew that, that we were our subject to robbery all the time. We had all sorts of things. We put it, left it, we put it at Ivashuk's house because they were gentle. So then they decided that, that uh, so we live, that, that we'll take it back. And then we don't live. Uh, they'll be, they'll inherit it. So sure enough, next time we were hiding and we heard them bringing the German police. Says the Jews must be here. It was him, I don't know, see? Uh, him, he heard. What was the life like in the ghetto? What was a typical day? We, just to get by, you have to, you know, have to get the food, to, to, 
to go into the market, and it was everything was a scramble. You just uh, cook, to wash the dishes, and uh, it was sort of, you know, unsettled. We didn't know what's next. Who was in charge? Who was in charge of the ghetto? In charge of the ghetto, uh, we had a Judenrat. Who was on that? The Judenrat's head was called uh, Michael Hatz. And there was a Goldman, and there was an Oberlander. I mean, they're all fine, upstanding people, but eventually, you know, how they became, they were, they were victim just as everybody else. How were they uh, put into that position? When the Germans came, they, they, I don't know, they said they have to have some Jews to negotiate with. So I don't think that not like it's not everybody. I don't know who volunteered for the position. Maybe I don't know how they came to be a, a, a young rat. I don't know. Who patrolled the streets? Was there anyone who patrolled or disciplined people? No, no, no. There was a, there was a Jewish police, but they didn't like. We never had any, I, I didn't have any trouble with them, my, my husband did. Do they have uniforms? They didn't have uniforms, they only had nightsticks. And, and in the beginning, they are there, you know, they said uh, so young people should come and register, become, you know, the, the, they call it Ordnungsdienst. You, know, you have to, you know, have to keep some order with you because we're so crowded. So they did, but then later on they used them. They didn't know what they volunteered for. Then they used them to help with the, with the what they called Ausbildung. I mean, they had to go and deliver the Jews, other Jews. So some quit, and some did. You know, you're in it. Do you remember any weddings in the ghetto? No, no, I don't remember that. So what about uh, babies born? Do you remember anything like that? Any new babies? There were some babies born. Were they able to have a bris? This I don't know. Maybe they did. Maybe they did. As long as there was someone to do it. But the, the babies didn't have much chance uh, to live long. Some people gave away, you know, like there was some people uh, gave away little babies to, for adoption. Some childless uh, Gentile people came and took some Jewish children. So people just gave them away. If you have a baby, you gave it away. Do you remember any religious life in the ghetto? Jewish services or any celebrations? I don't. As I said, I blocked out a lot of things. Were there any classes, anything else that you might remember from that time? No, I was forever reading, so there was always enough books for me to read. And today is May 30th, 1996, and our survivor is Frieda Bergman. I also forgot to say that we had to work during that time, so all the young people were given jobs by the UNRWA, doing all sorts of things. So I was sent to the, on the outskirts of town. There was a, a hill called Ripner, and, and there was a contractor. His name was Serafin, so he was building something. I don't know where. So we they sent out young girls like me to carry stones, like there was the stones were in the in the river bed. What was the name of the river? The river in Boroslav was called Tishminisa, but this was not the Tishminisa. It was some other river, I know, some stream or whatever name was stream. So we had to pick up those stones from the river bed and carry them with uh, four girls. You know, took. Uh, uh, like, um, what do you call it? Uh, a wheelbarrow? No, like, uh, like a, a stretcher, like sort of a stretcher, and put some stone on it, stones on it, and carry it to a certain place. How useful it was, I don't know, but we had to do it. What Did you, you got out, out of it, I don't know. Did you have any friends with you at that time? Yes, I had all my friends with them. And their names? Some of them are still alive. Some of them survived. Do you remember the, any of their names? One is, uh, one is in Israel. Her name is uh, Tunda Reiter. She was born Tunda Derfer at the time. 
The other one is in Germany. Her name is uh, Enrica Ringler. Well, she married Spiegler. And who else was there? Several of my friends were there with me. Were you ever in a position to help anyone at that time? In what way? Anyway. Yes, we were in a position like we always had, somehow we always said people were starving. And so, and we always had, one way or another, we had food. Because I said we had stashed away things, we had things to barter. And so my mother used to cook every day a big pot of soup. And whoever came to the door, as long as it lasted, she gave them the soup. But it didn't, like these people starved anyway. It was just a temporary. This was the first winter when there was starvation. Later, somehow, we didn't starve anymore because so many people were uh, transported out and they left all their belongings behind, behind them. So people, you know, we had, all we needed was things to barter. They were there, even though the people were put on the, on the transport, their uh, apartments were sealed. And then after they took everything out, they put it in a big warehouse. Who did this? The Germans, I don't, under orders of uh, I don't know who, there was a very big house, uh, with a, so they made a, a warehouse from it. It was like a big community house, so they made the warehouse of it, and they took every single schmuck, every single shoe, everything, and they put it in there, from, and um, they had the Jews come and sort out, you know, shoes, sell, and. They shipped everything to, to Germany. They put it on train and shipped it out. But still, there was, you know, there were still people who were able to help themselves. Those that survived were able to help themselves to certain things. Also, in the beginning, you, you had something. You tried, you thought maybe you have a, a future, so you maybe save it for tomorrow. But later on, we saw there's no tomorrow, so people just started bartering away everything they had. So there, this, there was no more starvation, one way or another. How long did you remain in the ghetto? I was in the ghetto, I would say, from, from fall 42 till spring 43. Spring 43, they, it was exactly in February 53, 43, uh, they had the, what they called an, an, an action, and they, they, the uh, razio, and they, we were trying, we, we were in the ghetto, so we were not as familiar with all the, you know, we tried to hide, but in our house we knew where to hide, but the ghetto was Where still, would you hide? You know, you always say, dug a, a tunnel, or, or you know, there was something, you know, and, uh, you had the shed, whatever, but in the, so we, so we tried to run out the back way, and we were caught immediately, my mother and my aunt and my cousin, and, and we were on the top, right? You know, in the back, in the back was uh, also the police coming. So I ran away. I was able to run away. Like we had a Jewish policeman leading and with the German. So he didn't look the way I ran away. He had enough people without me. I mean, he was, he, he was responsible for me, but he let me run away. So I went and there was abandoned Jewish houses there. Uh, and I, it was, uh, there was a blacksmith a Jewish blacksmith who had a, a, a smithy, and he had like all sorts of uh, empty warehouses, and they were full of of old furniture, old broken furniture. So I went and I hid in one of them. You I did this alone? All alone. I was, and uh, only my mother, my aunt, and my cousin, they were just led away. And uh, I hid under a broken, there was a headboard. So I was hiding, I just crawled down under, and I had, and, and I stayed, you know, it was in February, when it was a very severe in, in Poland, and I was just lying there under that head, but uh, several times they came looking for, not for me, for whoever might be there, but they didn't find me. They said something, and they ran away. And in the, at night, they never did anything at night. With, the, when, with sundown, everything was, they stopped. Why? Why, I don't know. That was the rule. They only I worked in, in daytime. So I knew where my father was. 
so I so I walked out at night and I knew where my father was. How long did you stay hidden like that? The day, through the day. And several times they came, they were just by, passing by me, so they had their legs. And I was like, like, it was the, it was tilted like this and I was here. And the head was. Uh, so I, uh, I walked out and I walked and through the back alleys, I walked to where my father was and I knew that they had a, a bunker there. And I knocked and they let me in. And I said the next day, and, the next day, and also they let my mother out. My mother also came. How did that happen? Uh, because uh, my mother was a very capable woman, and she, she uh, there was the guy who was uh, the German who was in charge of Jewish labor. His name was Keller, and he was a local man. He was, he was a German, but he was local. And he knew my mother. And he came and he, he, he got her out. He came and he got several people out. One of them was my mother. Of course, she, whatever she, everybody always carried whatever they had, money, jewelry with them. So she, while well, she was spent that day in, in that summer there, she said, she, everybody tried to, to hide it. So she put it behind the, the uh, bought or whatever, so we told her out, so she left everything behind her. But it, it wasn't funny that you needed jewelry to, to wear it, you needed to, to live. Um, so, so she also came there. And we said, uh, said that was the, was the time when they killed my husband's mother. And we survived. After this, they started, they, they made the ghetto smaller and smaller. After each each time they killed, killed a few thousand people, a few hundred, they squeezed the, the rest in. So that time, then they said that anybody, anybody under 18, you all have papers. Anybody, the, the, the people should go to camp. They started the camp, the first labor camp. But you could, if you're under 18, you couldn't go because you were considered a child. So How old were you? I was 17 and a half. My birthday was in July. So and what did you tell? What? So I was supposed to, so, so I, I had no right to live. And so my father found a man who knew a guy who, who kept Jews in his house. So my parents uh, paid him off, and he took me with him. There was his wife and his daughter and some other people were there. And uh, while my parents were still there, and my pa parents went and registered in the, in the in labor. Camp, the first labor camp, and they got those us that I showed you. And, and so and they, they paid them by month or by week or whatever to keep me hidden. So then, and then in, in June, they started liquidating the ghetto. Everybody, no, the only people that were in camp were so, supposed to. So that time, so the guy got scared. He just set us out. Out, he set out, I'm afraid they're going to kill me, they're going to kill me and my children, I can't keep you any longer. What did you think would happen next? At that point, what did you think was going to happen? I thought they'll catch me, they'll kill me. I said, I was, I cannot say that, I, I wasn't even scared. I was, I was, it was, it was a given that you're not supposed to live, sooner or later. I mean, you try to do, to make it later, but the, so I knew they catch me, they'll shoot me, what a big deal. So, uh, so I was able to, I don't know how my parents found out that I was out on the street, I don't remember. Uh, so, but my parents found another man who said that he was, see, like, we were not, as, as you brought us from, the, uh, the industry was not in one place because each, all well, had a few, a few people working on it. So we were not confined. The people were, so that man worked in that place where I worked before on that hill rip, and he said there is a shed there, and it's out of town, and, and uh, he'll take me along, and he'll hide me there until they can do something. So he said his sister was there, and his nephews, and you know, his family was there too, because they were in the same situation as me. Uh, so he took me there, we walked through town, through the whole town, each step was uh, 
but they caught us. Uh, we would be shot immediately. So we passed the town. We were out of town. We were on that hill in the woods. And um, a few hours later, somebody saw us going there and brought the German, the, the Russian, the Ukrainian police. And they, they took us all out. They ordered us out, and I have no recollection. And I remember they beat me up. I was swollen, and they took us all out through the town, and we passed by the by the first labor camp. And uh, my husband saw me, and my mother saw. My mother also stood in the window, and they took us to the to the Ukrainian police, and they put us in, in the cellar. How many of you had been brought in then? And you know, that time they did like five here and ten here. They they, they called it they clean out the, the ghetto. And whenever they had a hundred people, they took them. It wasn't worthwhile, you know, to make any transports, so they they shot them. So by the time they maybe had forty, fifty, and I don't even remember what day of the week it was. And and so they counted us and they waited for more. So in the meantime, my parents were still knew some people. Maybe they they still had some money. Uh, they. Were in, so my father said my father had lots of friends and, and uh, were still, you know, in different positions. So they were able. So in order to people, all the people that were in camp had those R's. What did this look like? Shall I show you? Yeah, it's it was a piece of material like linen. It had an R standing for restaurant industry means armament industry, embroidered by machine. It had. And it had on the other side, it had a stamp from the Gestapo, and on the other side it had a number, because the, the forced labor camp in Borisov had a certain amount of R's, I don't know, people said 600 or 700, and, and they were limited. Once they, they issued them, that's it. So, so that guy Keller, who took my mother out, he was in charge of the Jewish labor. So my mother got in touch with him. I don't know how. And it wasn't easy. She was not allowed to walk. But she said, if, he have, I, have, if I have a knife, she, if my mother gets a knife for me, he'll give me the, the piece of paper that I belong in the camp. He'll hire me, in other words. So that is how you, where you get the knife. You could buy one. The people that were young people, like my husband had a knife and cost him a penny because he was actually digging ditches, and he got it for free. So there were other people like him, and they wanted to go to escape to Hungary, which at the time was still more or less free. So in order to finance their escape, they were selling their arts. So my parents were able to get one from a guy named Herbert Landner, and they had not what they paid him, so they had an art, and they had me, and they had Carol's promise that um, he'll give me the paper if I, so I had to come to his office, and I had to have a, uh, an Ausweis, an identity card with a picture in it. So in order to get, the, oh, this I am running ahead of myself. So anyway, so I had to get me out of the cellar. I was still in cellar before. So my father was a friend of the head of the Jewish Ordnungsdienst, so he went to him to get me out. And uh, see, if he had his uh, niece or his mother there, he wouldn't come for me. But just so happened that particular day, there was none of his relatives there. So he was willing to come and get me out. And what did he get? He, uh, he knew he'd, he'd, get, he'd, he'd take me out today. He'd, he'd deliver me to the uh, week or two later. So he was willing to go. And he was the one. And also, uh, Dr. Reisers, who was the translator for the German police, he also knew us. So he also came, agreed to come and get me out. So the two of them came to get me out. So they got me out. They, I didn't know. I was in the cellar. And I went to I was tired. I was beaten up. I took my coat. I still had the coat. And I lied down, and I slept on the floor. What were you wearing besides the coat? What other clothing did you have? This coat was still, I think this coat was something that was left from my aunt, because I see in the picture that this is my aunt's coat, because I have a picture of my aunt in that coat. So somehow that coat survived. It was a green tweed coat. I, <laughs> and what else were you wearing? 
And I said, well, I didn't get dressed. I, 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 always, I never went barefoot. I always, somehow I always had shoes. So they came and they took me, and so they called me out. I don't know what they called me out for. Who called you? The police, or not the, the, the police. They said, the Frida Hammerman out. So I went out. What did I, you think was going to happen? I could, I, I had, I tell you, I didn't even, I don't think I blocked it out. So I came up to, he was sitting there, the lemons were, he had a big belly, big beard belly, he said like this, and, and that uh, Eisenstein and Reiter were standing in front of him, and he said, oh, that's, you said, and the other said, that's her, yes, he said, the big messiah, he thought, <laughs> what I look like, I don't need to tell you, probably, I get, if I'm, you know, I, I get, I'm, I get dark, I get black, <laughs> everybody gets, but I, I, have, I have a dark skin, so I, I must have looked horrible, but what did he care? So he, they, so they took, she said, let her, she said, let her go. So the, the ghetto was already liquidated, but they still had, the, the Jewish ordnance list still had one house where they had their post. So he took me there. So the writers went wherever he wanted, that Eisenstein. He took me there and, and he set me down there in that, on the police. And I didn't have a piece, I didn't have a paper, I didn't have anything. I was not supposed to walk. And I, I needed the, the, the photographer, the picture to, to get the paper. So, and there was still a Jewish photographer holed up someplace in town. This was official or not official? This I don't know whether it was official or not, but he was still there. Maybe, maybe semi-official. So we got there, so we said we have, we have no choice. We have to go and get the, the picture taken in order to go to Carol to get the paper. So my mother got the R and, the, and so, and I guess he must have done it uh, immediately. I don't know what, they, what system they had that they can develop, maybe anyway. So we walked, so I, my mother and I were walking through the, you know, through the back alleys, not to go on the front street. And who do you think, we were walking to the, to the photographer, and who do you think comes across? The same Nevis, who just let me out a few hours before with Dr. Rices, the, the translator. That Dr. Rices saw us, he nearly fainted. Uh, but uh, my mother was able to talk us, so he says, so I said, what are you doing here, he said. He said, look at the two ugly, uh, ugly uh, Jewesses. Uh, and um, so he said, let us, he, he let us go. He said, he says, oh, yeah, now he said, now must to stand, he said, you have to die now. So my mother said, I still have time, he said, I mean, he, he liked to joke. <laughs> so he, he let us go. So my mother said, I have time, he said, I'm not going to run away, you, you'll get me. And so we went and we got the picture and we got the pay, we went to, I had to go to care. He wanted to see me, he needed to see me. And I suppose that my parents must have bribed them with some, I'm sure they did. Where they had the money, I don't know. They must have hidden someplace. And so and I came to the camp. And which camp was this? It was the Zwangsarbeitslager in uh, Barislov. And also, so they put me in there like I have to, you know, clean and cook and whatever, help, and the lager uh, help. And, and so this was in June 43. And I stayed there till the spring of 44, through the winter. Where did you sleep? And we had, see, my mother, my parents were wholesalers of soap. And um, my mother learned how to make soap. She had a friend who knew how to make soap. So she learned how to make soap. And, and uh, she said she can, so she can make soap from uh, nothing, it's fat. Anyway, so she was able to get, I think like a carrot, you know, got to set her up that she's making soap. She made soap like, <laughs> but then it was a sort of a scam, but it, it, went, you know, it went on. So she, he put me in as her helper, and she, we didn't have to sleep in the camp. There was like a separate, the building that we were in, used to be, belong to a big company who had an oil company. They had offices and stables and, and uh, warehouses all around like in a big courtyard. So this was like maybe, 
offices. It wasn't the office. It was a separate building. We were there, so we slept there too. And uh, we were able to sleep. The, we, at home, we had the folding ch a chair like this that you know you could open, you could take out a pillow. And somehow we slept it mostly through the camp, through the ghetto. We still had it in camp. I slept on it on the floor. It was like open top, two pillows open top. I slept on it. What did you eat? We ate. We, they fed us, like the camp got some food, they gave us soup every day. What was the soup like? The soup was they, see, they made a big kettle of soup with potatoes and whatever they could, they, they gave us some food, like uh, some margarine, I would say, some, um, um, some uh, jam made from beets. She think not not much, but we, as I said, we still we were in our hometown, and we still had you know so we knew, so we had some whatever you know things to barter stash away obviously, and we were still able to get food you know, to go out and we were able to get out. Did well, you have contacts uh, with non Jews? Yeah, we had contacts, yes, with guys, and they would sell us food. Did you get news about the war? Yes, we did. We what did, did you hear from the guy? What, did, what reports did you we get? We heard that the front is moving. We, we heard that they opened the second front in Italy. We heard that we were in the camp. Then we heard, we kept on hearing that the Russian front is moving closer and closer. It was in the papers. You had access to newspapers? Yes. Not, not, not officially, but people that worked in offices, because uh, it, it, there was a lot of people worked in offices, because um, the Orwell industry was given as a presence to Gehring. And then all, that's how the Jews came to be in Baroslav. Because uh, in order to drill for oil, you need a driller. Sits out on the tower and knows what to do. And it takes uh, a number of years. In Baroslav, they had a special school for it. And there were a number of Jewish drillers who knew how to do it. They even went to work out to Indonesia all over before the war. So when they gave him, yeah, so the, he put somebody in charge that bites, put him on top, on charge of, the, of his property. He says, I cannot deliver any or if I have no drillers. So he says, so what are the drillers? He said, dead. So get me some Jewish drillers. So he, they, he got permission to get some Jewish drillers. They put them on to drill. And then uh, an enterprise of that size, all the, all the oil wells that belonged to hundreds of people were under one control. He says, I cannot do it unless I have accountants. So where are the accountants? The Jews. He said, get some Jewish accountants. So the Jewish accountants, and uh, you know, there is one a Jewish accountant. He has two helpers or whatever. So we write so, so that way. And in the offices, they were in touch with the, with the Gentiles. So they got papers. How did you keep clean when you were in this camp? We had the communal showers. What um, about bathrooms, latrines? There was a latrine, yes. And what about the sleeping area? There was, see, there were, for everybody else, there were, uh, they called preachers. Like, they had, see, this used to be, see, that uh, family, Manova, who owned that place before, they had, offices and apartments for their employees. So there were some very large rooms, so they put a lot of people in and they made like uh, one big uh, from wood. They made like one big uh, platform. Everybody slept next to each other. But there were some smaller rooms. There were some people with the apartments had uh, pantries and they had toilets or whatever. Everything was occupied. So let's say maybe so whoever had the pool, I mean, there was still a, uh, maybe somebody had a wife and a child, maybe, and there was still some family, or two brothers, or two sisters, or whatever. They were able to get one of those smaller rooms. Uh, but uh, we didn't have anything, because we were able to sleep where we were supposed to make the soap. What do you so, think the age range was of the people who were with you? I would say that uh, all the I would say I don't think anybody was over 50. I cannot think of anybody over 50. 
Mm -hmm. Mostly young people that, you know, uh, like my, my husband and his brother. Most like them. How young and do you think you, the youngest was? You know, so you had to be more than 18. Were there any babies born there? There were some babies. A friend of ours had a baby, and he was, uh, he was, uh, he lived in Vienna for a long time, so he spoke German, and he worked for that police, same as Dr. Reiser, so he was able to live not in camp, but across the street. You know, they had a few houses. Uh, so they just, they, they had a baby boy, and they just put him to, to they had a doctor give him an injection. And the same doctor, who happens to be a very close friend of ours, he had a little, so he was there with his wife, he had a little boy. So the boy, he also lived out of, across the street from the camp, and he worked in the, in the, in the Gentile uh, clinic. So he, so he walked every day to work, and I know what she did, but the little boy was in the fields. Whenever, like he was in, never there was, uh, there was a uh, Russia, whatever. They sent him out, and he just like blow, and they survived all of them. Then they, they when he had to happen to be a redhead, so he had to hide his hair. They should have seen him. What sort of conversations would you have when you were together with other people there? You'd be surprised. People used to sing and play games and play cards. What sort of games would they play? All sorts. Dominoes. They played. They played cards, and, and, and they used to gather and sing. And what types of songs were they singing? Also, you know, like uh, old to G, you know, the Yiddish folk songs and Polish and Russian. And they sang. Yes, sang, singing was the entertainment. And my husband had to dance. He made a million. And they sang Shalushidas. Did he tell you about it? No, he never got there. And when they were singing Shalashidas, people like him, and, and, and uh, Gestapo walked by, said, what's going on here? So they saw, he said, so he was, he said, give them a breath. They got the. <laughs> Today is May 30th, 1996, and now we're survivors, Frida Bergman. I mentioned before that my husband and his uh, friends were down in, in camp, but he was not my husband yet. We just have been neighbors, so we knew each other, and so we saw what everybody else was doing, and we kept uh, not really in touch, but we were aware of each other, so we were neighbors. So then uh, we come back so spring of 44, we knew that the, German, that the Germans are retreating. How did you know this? I mean, it was in the air. You just knew. You saw, you, you, I said, we, got, we had thought, we had papers, we had, uh, we had the contact with the Gentile population who listened to radios, and we had papers, and we, knew, we just knew. So we knew that the Russian front is moving forward. And uh, at the rate they were going, they will be soon near us. And we knew two things. That the Germans were going to leave us just there for the Russians to, to, to liberate us. They do something with us, and we don't expect anything good. So we tried to escape. And since we were living uh, in the camp, who was not uh, under strict control, you were able to get in and out more or less, because, uh, as I said before, like the column went out of the, uh, assembled in the camp and walked out and uh, walked together for a couple of uh, blocks, and then everybody went to their, their particular place of, of uh, work. So people were working uh, in, in the woods, because some of the oil was were in the woods, so they were able to make, uh, build the bunkers and some and, out and, and come back and forth, you know, work in day and work in, and when the column assembled, they didn't, they were very strict, they didn't count us. So the few people more or less didn't come back, they make, it made no difference. So they stayed overnight, which was also punishable by death, and they dug uh, bunkers, 
some close by, some deep in the woods, and try to put some food in them because we didn't know. We knew that once you're in those bunkers, you cannot walk out anymore. You have to have some food in order to be able to survive a few weeks or a few months or whatever. So some people, for this you needed money to, to, to dig the, the bunkers, you didn't need, need the strong hands. But to buy food from the Gentiles, which they were supposed to sell us any, so they you had to have either a gold watch or, or the money, dollars, or, and, and of course they overcharged all they could because they were not supposed to do it. They tried to make a buck. But this you needed money. So there was a group of young men who built a bunker deep in the woods. Some of them were village boys from Jewish village. And they knew the woods and they knew the neighborhood and they knew how to walk around in the woods, but he didn't have any idea. How did you know about this bunker? So because these people were with us. They were like, so there's a few village boys and they went out and they built a bunker deep. They knew how to walk in the woods without breaking uh, uh, branches and making, uh, 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 was leaving a, a path. They knew how because they were from the villages. We, so they told, and so a group of these boys went out and they built a bunk a bit deep in the woods and they needed money to, to, to put in their food. So they looked for people that still had some money to pay for it. So they contacted my parents and they agreed on a certain amount of money to take us all, the three of us, to that bunker. And they said they cannot, it was deep in the woods and also mountainous. So they said it was winter, it was, uh, they said they cannot take all of us together because they have to count that they'll have to carry us as we were not woodsmen and they were. So they said they take us one at a time. So my parents said that they gave them a third of the money and they sent me first. And they were supposed to come back two weeks later and take my mother and take another part of the money and then come for my father. So anyways, they took me and we walked in that, in that storm and, the, and, and over the mountains, over and was, and this, uh, was windy because the mountain tops are very windy. And we, of course, when we didn't have any, we had no mess, we had no, no goggles, we, <laughs> we had no cream to protect our skin. We were, some of us even didn't have shoes. But anyway, we made it to the bunker and they bought the, whatever they were supposed, beans, barley, things that can uh, last. And so they, we have food and they were, and when they were supposed to come back for my parents, there was a big storm. There was no way they could not get, they could not get out. And that storm lasted, and, and you cannot walk, not only the storm, because this, the snow is deep, you leave, you leave um, uh, tracks. So they will come straight to the, to the bunker. And, and you know, the population, the local population only waited for that. So we had to protect ourselves not only from the Germans, but also from the local population. Who was with you in the bunker at that point? Uh, there were some people that before, like besides the boys that built the bunkers, there were some people from the Hobbit, which is a neighboring town, was also the same situation as me. They still had, you know, they bought their way in. How did you keep yourself warm there? We were in, in, in the bunker, it's warm, because it's uh, in the ground. It wasn't cold. And we did, at night, and, and we had like a Franklin stove, and we did it, uh, at night we did the cooking, and at night, in daytime we slept. Uh, so, uh, so one night, there were two sisters from the harbor, her name was Lieber, Edgar Genia Lieber, and some other people. There was um, Dr. Pell, and, and, and they were, I mean, they were the, the guest group. And, uh, and so then the house group did the labor, and uh, we were just waiting, you know, to be liberated. Uh, but so my parents, so they couldn't leave the bunker, and it took a few weeks. By that time, uh, they already took, the Germans surrounded the camp, and took one group of people who were to Plashov. So at that time, so my parents 
they are they didn't they they there was not communication there was not even communicate we were completely cut off they were cut off we were cut off so they took their money they bought their way into another group which was the closer and they went with them where was that and this was in june already we already where got, was it where did they go this wasn't uh, see the that wasn't the um, the bunker was in the woods that were close to Baroslav. See, ours was deep down in the mountains. This was closer. But we were at the foot of a Carpathian mountain, so they're deep woods. Where did your parents go? So they went with another group to a different wood, to a different forest. And uh, before you could say boo, they were denounced, and they had the razzia, and they caught all the Jews and brought them back to camp. Now we are talking to June. We're talking June 44. Uh, in the meantime, the Russian offensive stopped. They they crossed the, the they came to Ravna, and they stopped at the river, could cross the river there. So it took them instead of progressing normally, they were just stopped. The front didn't move. That's when. So then they so my parents were in camp with all the other people that were rounded up. And they had another Russia. This time they took them already with the front was close, it was not yet in Borisov, was much closer. They the through was in the Carpathian Mountains already. They couldn't take them to Plashov, so they took them now my father they still took to Plashov. Oh, so they so my in the camp my parents tried to hide, so my mother was success hit while they was uh, my and they caught my father. They shipped them to Plashov. It was in uh, June 44. And my mother, after this, my mother went and she had, it, it was a matter of weeks. She had, uh, she knew a, 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 a Gentile woman who took her in. She put, she had a, like a little uh, pig sty or whatever, I know what she had, the pig, but she had like a little structure in the back and she stuck her in there. And she kept her there for a few weeks till they were liberated. And my father was sent to, to Plashov, and from Plashov he was sent to Mauthausen, and, and Mauthausen was in Zwei, and, and he was killed there. He was a big, hefty man, and he was used, he needed food. And these people, whoever was big and hefty, perished first. If you didn't get food, you just died. Like the Dutch people came from Holland, they all fell away like flies. And people from uh, that was crony and, and sickly, they survived, they didn't, they didn't much food. So my father was in Mount in Rosenzweig, and it was one of the most terrible camps, and it was in Austria, and uh, he, he, he got the, if, from mal malnutrition, he got the carbuncle on his leg, and they took him to the hospital, and they killed him with the, with the injection of benzene. And he was an I mean, they took him to the hospital, you're not coming to come out. So he talked to a man he knew, a, a, you know, a, a landsman, just before he died. And that person was always sickly. His name was Erlich. He survived. And he told us about it. When and, and then we were liberated in, in August, the, the front moved, so, so from June to August, it's. Uh, six, seven weeks, we were liberated by the Russians, we crept, crept out, and while we were in the woods, we, shot, we saw the German front retreating. We saw people, you know, we How saw, did you feel? Oh, we always hoped that we got to survive, and also, not only did we have to hide from the Germans, I said, but the Ukrainians were just out, and they killed the Jews, and didn't even, not for robbery, just to kill them. Just to kill, they went from, you know, like if they saw a track or whatever, they followed it and, and they killed quite a number of people in the bunkers, just with, with knives, just like, like you shaft like an animal. And so we, we had to be careful of them too, they shouldn't find us. How were you treated by the Russians at liberation? We, we were treated like, like we know, like we not together, we not, like, like we, when they came, we were all enemies because uh, the Ukrainians were with the Germans. We were in the Ukrainian territory, so, so we fell under the same category as the Ukrainian population. And some of the boys that survived 
So the, the Ukraine, the Russians uh, conscripted almost everybody that walked. Everybody had two lines was conscripted into the army, and they made sure that the Ukrainians don't survive, so they sent them right in front where the minefields are. So some of the Jewish boys that survived Hitler, and they was there conscripted and sent to the front line never to come back. They did. I think only one came without the leg, and the others just died. Delib they deliberately sent them out that way. Instead what? of shooting them, they sent them to, to say that we did some, you know, on the, the minefields. Were the women harmed or molested? Not that I know of. No, no, see, the, the, the Russian uh, raped and molested the women in Germany. But here, when we were actually part of the Russian territory at the time, except they wanted to get rid of the Ukrainians, because the Ukrainians made the, the known, their own government, and they, and they supplied soldiers to Hitler. So they couldn't say everyone was, uh, but they couldn't say it openly, the Russians. They had to make another you know, good face and get rid of them somehow. And they also, they set up partisan units to fight the Russians in the war. They were called Banderovtsas. They first they fought the Jews, then they fought the Russians. Were you fed anything by the Russians or helped? No, not at all. Not at all. They treated us like, like they treated everybody. The truth is, when we just walked out, some of the Russians, when we saw who, can, who defeated the Germans, See, the Germans were fully motorized. They had trucks and, and motorcycles and lorries and whatnot, and they were defeated. You know, they were moving back, and they were well-fed and, and uniformed. And, and we saw who was coming after them, those tiny little scrawny Mongols from, from Middle Central Asia, and they were riding carts with, they had, animals, you know, I don't know whether it's donkeys or mules or whatever, tiny little ones, not even horses, pulling those carts. They had, they had yokes made out of wood. We never saw it in Poland before. And, and they, were beating the, they were beating the Germans. And they saw, so they saw us coming out of the wood. They had, gave us some bread. But it, it, was like, it was like clay, you know, the Russian bread. But uh, this was only for a day. And Where did you go next? Next, uh, I came, and my mother was, since my mother was already in town, she didn't know whether I survived or not. I didn't know anything of these things. I didn't know what happened. We were completely cut off. So I met my mother, and we, and I, one of my aunts. What was your condition at that time? Uh, look, we lived in the woods. We were not uh, fat, but we were not uh, starving either. So. Uh, look, I was, I was 19 years old. What can you do to a 19 years old? Uh, so, and, so, and we wanted, so we wanted to go back to our house. But the last day of war, a shrapnel, it was empty. We could go back. I mean, the, the, uh, it start all over again. But the shrapnel tore off the front of the house. It had to be fixed. So I was going to fix it. My mother and my aunt and me. So there was another, there was a house, a Jewish house, that everybody that survived moved in there. So we, we also went there, you know, that all the Jews, you know, they stuck to each other. We were afraid, we were, we just, we kept on looking which way the front moves, because the front was not the Carpathian Mountain. So we saw the troops moving towards Hungary and the Carpathians, and, and we saw the, the wounded coming back. And then we, we Watch very carefully when the front is not coming back, but the Germans are not coming back. But they did. So this uh, lasted maybe six weeks until the, the, they had the, they broke through the mountains. Were you able to find any surviving family members uh, besides? Right, I'm coming to it. So we were with all those other Jews in that apartment, and I said my mother still had some gentle women that, that knew her, that maybe so the one the woman that hid her, and. Um, so we were there, and then one of our cousins, who was served in the Russian army, and the Russian army had a custom that whoever liberated his hometown got 10 days furlough. So that cousin got 10 days furlough, and he lived in the neighboring 
path to the Hobbit, which is like Brooklyn and, and Manhattan, like twin city, twin towns. We knew it was so. He came to the Hobbit, she looked at that, he didn't find anybody. But the, uh, one of the houses uh, was still, uh, like this house that belonged to our, my and his grandfather, great grandfather, was standing. It was a sizable house in the middle of town and uh, had a nice garden because it was built in 1910. So he wanted this house, he, so, he, so he went there and this house, uh, all the Jewish houses that were either taken over by the Gestapo during the German occupation were taken over by the end over there immediately for housing, to house their people. But so he went there and he found already the anchor the living there, their families, but you see he had their rifle. He said, That's my house, get the hell out of here. And they did. He said, That's my house by my house alone, but the rifle. But then he said, I'm going away back to the army and if I come back, if I survive, I come back, I have a house. I'll be a man if I come back and there is nothing, I'll be a uh, a schlep. So he said, I like this house kept for me. So he says, your house is destroyed. He says, come with me, live in this house. And if I come back, I'll, I'll we'll have a house. You'll have, you'll have, I'll have. So my aunt lives stayed in Barislav, but my mother and I, we, <laughs> we just walked over a few miles and, and, and another cousin. So, the, so we lived on, my mother and I lived on one side of the house. Another cousin that his wife lived on the other side of the house. And, and uh, just so happened that we lived there for a year. And then where did you go? And then and, uh, we went to, uh, see, like this, we were under uh, Russian rule. And we thought we'll stay. We didn't think of, uh, that we'll ever get out. But when the war ended, not even before, the Polish government in exile made an agreement with the Russian government about exchange of population. They, because that area that we come from was always uh, a source, uh, you know, of, of war. The Poles rule, the Ukrainians rule, so then let's, let's finish it. All the Poles go to Poland, and all the Ukrainians come here. Uh, that's called the Curzon Line, the, the rivers, the uh, book and sun. So this was the, the sham, that was the demarcation line. So they posted, uh, everything was posted. Uh, the, 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 that all the Polish citizens should register to go, and they'll be sent to Poland. So first of all, we were we didn't know whether the Jews were under which category we are in. So they said Jews too. Secondly, you know, with the experience we had from before, many of you registered, they'll send you to Siberia. So we figured we'll wait and see, see what happens. So some people took their chances. And they went, and they went to Poland, and we heard that they really went to Poland. So, so we registered two. We were permitted to take uh, 2,000 pounds with us. So we made, the, the, that year we acquired, you know, from the, my mother was selling salt, and uh, my husband, which we were not married yet, but he was hanging around. He was, uh, see, his family had a part of a, chemical plant, so he worked there from before. They made uh, candles and shoe polish, uh, so he went there and he worked there. So, so he also made a few dollars, you know, selling candles and shoe polish and, and the axle grease they made. So we had acquired, we were acquired a few pieces of clothing and shoes and I, I don't know, remember what else, pots, pens, and we packed up. And he and uh, he took his brother, another young man, another boy who stay in Williamsburg, and we and we the station was bumped out, and we registered. In the meantime, the war ended, and we were still in the celebration when they celebrated the end of the war. And then the Russian troops started coming back, and uh, we were so anybody who wanted to go to Poland had to go to the station and camp there until the transport came. So we packed up and we were living in the, in the, you know, in the boxes until the train came. And uh, we loaded it, Poles and Jews, and 
also some people, you know, they wanted to get rid of the Polish population to some Polish villages, whole villages. So they, see, we volunteered, we wanted to go, but those peasants didn't want to go. So they packed them, but they liked or not. They brought them, you know, with their animals, and they loaded them in the train, and, and we went to Poland. When and and we get? had, on the train, we got fresh milk because they had those cows with them. And uh, we, uh, before we left, we bought, uh, we made butter, we, we rendered it. We didn't know how long we were going to be on the train. When did you finally get married? Uh, then we came to Poland, and uh, we got married in Germany. It took us two years. Yeah, we got married in December 1946. Uh, then mm -hmm. I went to, my husband went to Breslau, I went to Waldenburg, we were my auntie, we were just, you know what? I consider that year that we wandered around, homeless, it was, uh, but not, you know, not scared of death. I, now I think of it, it was very pleasant. In the, no obligations, no nothing. Three. At what point did you get married? What we was the got, date? So then we came to Germany, and I came first. I came a few months before, and then he came to Germany. We got married. We had a baby. What's your husband's name? My husband is Mario Moshe Bergman. And we came to America, and, and uh, we had two more children. We really built our lives. What are the children's names? Uh, the oldest is uh, Razi, Razlin. Falk, and there's Henry, Yehuda Svi, Bergman, and there is Hanar and Teutman. They all married, and I said, we rebuilt our lives. And my mother was with me, and she, she said she had grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and she died when she was almost 90. When you were in Germany, just going back to one point, yeah. uh, where did you live? We lived in Ulm under Donau, uh, but I also lived in Erlangen because uh, I decided to go to college. So I took the equivalency test for high school, which I never finished. But my memory was still good. I still remember my Latin, remembered my Latin and my, and my math and so on. I went to Munich and I passed the test. I have the paper for it. And I enrolled at the university in Erlangen. And uh, my husband left me. <laughs> he was always very indulgent. And uh, then we went to, to America, and I never continued. How far did you go with your actual education? I finished uh, two years, like four semesters. And that's about it. Then I came to America, and I. When was that? We came to America in August '49. He, my husband got to work the same week. He went to polish uh, jewelry. He had an 11 months old child. And uh, within a year, I learned how to do Since I'm good at math, I figured out to do it. I went to business school, I, and within a few months, I knew how to do bookkeeping. And then and there he had to show me the system. And I got a job as a bookkeeper, and little by little, we prospered. They saw the children, educated them, married them off. Was there any point in the war where you hid your Jewish identity? During like, the war? The what, what? During the war, did you ever hide your Jewish identity? Uh, not really. I was never, I never considered. I have friends and other people that got, uh, they were called Aryan, as opposed to Jewish papers. And they went out, and most of them were caught. Most of them. I never considered that. We considered it, but I was never. Re and I, like, my Polish was very good, and I had Jewish, I had Gentile friends, but I never did. Most of them were caught immediately. Some survived. But when we were after the, like, when we were in Poland, right after the war, we were, we came with the mainstream of the Polish people from, from Russia. And there was, we were settled all together in the, in Silesia that was taken over from the Germans. So all people over, you know, were like us from elsewhere or maybe, so we got an apartment, we got, but 
And we did not hide that we were Jewish, but we did not advertise it either. We were living in Poland and we were traveling the, the railroads and uh, living with the Poles. And I said, we did not advertise it. So it wasn't really hiding, but you're not just uh, flowing with the stream. Did you ever uh, question the existence of God? I am not philosophically inclined. I am very, I live with the, I learn to live with the minute. I take whatever comes my way and make the best of it. I never pondered philosophical questions. How would you describe your religious affiliations now? Now I am Orthodox, my husband is very Orthodox, my children are Orthodox. And um, we live that way. All my friends are Orthodox now. I have no regrets. How do you spend your free time? I never have enough time for all the things I want to do. I am involved in many things. As I have a lot of friends to take up my time. Uh, I, I read a lot. I do need to work a lot. I have some, I made this. Oh, not supposed to do that. And um, I go to lectures, I go to, to museums, I go to the theater, I, I go to Manhattan quite often. And sometimes uh, my children need me, sometimes they need something, I do it for them, sometimes I do it for other things. I'm always busy. This is the end of our tape.